Good afternoon. Uh, I was here today to discuss a recent project that I was involved in to connect. Good afternoon. Uh, I was here today to discuss a recent project that I was involved in to connect Acme, uh, Acme's AV collection with Wikidata and to leverage these connections for a variety of different purposes. I was personally very interested in this because while I knew of a few kind of museums and galleries who had gone down this path, uh, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with any AV archives, so I was, I was keen. Uh, so what is Wikidata? Well, you're kind of looking at it here and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it, but I wanted to quickly um, provide a brief intro just in case. So Wikidata is a platform which is run by Wikimedia Foundation and it was originally meant as a method to synchronize data statements between different language versions of Wikipedia, but it has since uh, developed into a significant resource in its own right. So here is uh, the Wikipedia page for Pygmy Hello. Rock, which has, um, there's a lot of text, but in there there's a lot of kind of data statements and um, here's the Wikidata page where you can see those data statements expressed as uh, semantic triples Picnic Hanging Rock is an instance of a film. Picnic Hanging Rock has director Peter Weir. So these are all kind of data statements about the thing. But I think what is a particularly interesting use for Wikidata is as an agnostic kind of hub of identifiers, uh, which you can see down here. Here they all are. So just a long, long, long list of identifiers uh, connecting databases, uh, web platforms, streaming services, um, and audiovisual institutions. Uh, and what's really interesting about this is um, this then provides a jumping off point to um, mashing up different collection APIs. Uh, we'll see an example of that a bit later. So uh, matching Acme and Wikidata the logistics. So this was the foundational, the foundational part of the process. Uh, and there were lots of different approaches which were tried um, because we were trying to find pre-existing entities. So for instance, um, Acme already had Pink and Hanging Rock in their collection. Picnahang Rock is on Wikidata and making the connection where it already existed, but also identifying things that were more obscure, and we'll talk about obscurity in a second, that were more obscure and where we actually needed to create a Wikidata page. And so really invaluable in this process was OpenRefine, and you can see, uh, and particularly it's inbuilt Wikidata reconciliation service. So here I've loaded up about 5,000 Acme records. We have the Acme kind of label, we have an ID, a director, an ID, a date, and a a place and here I've just gone through and already started um, federating the, uh, sorry, not federating, reconciling the countries. So France, which was in the ACME database, is the same as France Q142. Uh, and then I would do the same for the directors and the, the artistic works. Um, and yeah, creating where they previously did not exist. We also added some one-click uh, creation tools. So um, here is our XOS uh, administration, which is our museum uh, operating system. And over here on the right, um, we've got these two little buttons plus to create a Wikidata entity uh, for this creator. And also we can search Wikidata to see if one already exists. Um, we also have the equivalent ones for works over on the right hand side so we can add a new wikidata entity search again or else for works we can also import wikidata into the blank fields um, so yeah handy tools for our collections team so um on the subject of obscurity i wanted to quickly touch on uh, notability. So Wikidata and Wikipedia both feature uh, the concept of notability and this is the measure by which they judge if a person or a film or anything is worthy of inclusion on their platform and this is presumably um, to keep entities from really blowing out the number of uh, pages they have from really blowing out but also a technical consideration um, based on I suppose what their servers can hold right uh, and so this was a concept that that kind of came up right because uh, Acme has a has a vast collection, and they hold they hold um, they have Academy Award winning films, they have uh, blockbusters, they have cult classics, but they also have uh, lots of home movies and lots of training videos. And the question then of whether this was these were sort of sufficiently notable to um, to create uh, pages for really. Uh, and this situation kind of reminded me of something that I came across when I was working with Sight and Sound, uh, the Sight and Sound twenty twelve. Uh, um, 
film poll uh, and votes from that. And um, I remembered specifically Alexander Horwath's um, entry for uh, this amazing thing, Fox News Outtakes 4-399-400 New York City Street Scenes and Noises. So this was one of his 10 votes for greatest films of all time. Uh, and the question being, I mean, are these Fox outtakes really, these specific Fox News outtakes, really worthy of their own page? Uh, and my conclusion was that it was by nature of having been voted for in a highly prestigious uh, film poll. And I felt that the same attitude um, was appropriate for home movies. On their own, they probably would not qualify, but belonging to a, uh, a major kind of... Um, national collecting institution um yeah it was it was worthwhile to uh, to add them in so uh so th sorry that was some notes on the linking process and i should uh highlight that that is not actually done yet we still do have a bit of a way to go but uh in parallel we've been looking at other things that you can do to leverage those links once that they have been uh, once they have been made so the most obvious is that you can federate the ACME collection data with the Wikidata statements. And this I thought was interesting because I felt like there is data here which an audiovisual archive would potentially not necessarily have in their system, but would possibly be interested in using as a different lens by which to view their collection items. Uh, and just to pull out two here that I thought were interesting, we have here the original box office takings of Pink Hang Rock um, on the year of release. Uh, maybe another interesting metric here, the Betchel test, which is a, a, um, a way of qualifying kind of female agency uh, within a film. Uh, you know, and again, these are things that an audiovisual institution would possibly not already have in their database, but could, would absolutely um, could see where they would have interest in being able to pull this in on a needs basis as a different way of uh, as a different way of kind of viewing their own collection. So another interesting byproduct of connecting all this up was the ability to federate uh, holdings information. So here, starting with the Wikidata ID, I jumped across to both the ACME Collection API and the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia's Collection API to pull in the holdings information against this film. And so you get a sense of what holdings exist in each institution. Uh, and as ACME noted, if they can identify where there are better components which already exist elsewhere or uh, pre preservation activity has already occurred, then that this is an interesting, um, an interesting way for them to devote their digitization resources more appropriately. ACME are also super interested in the reuse of media and summaries from Wikipedia and Wikidata, uh, particularly to enrich their online uh, collection search portal page. Uh, so here are two Jupyter Notebooks. Well, we'll see the first one that I did up for them. Um, so here you can put in the Acme, the Acme work ID. Here it is for uh, another uh, early Australian film story, The Kelly Gang. Um, this creates this kind of, it jumps across to Wikidata based on that link. It creates this kind of really concise uh, summary, which is generated out of Wikidata statements. You have this more verbose kind of um, description of the film, which is taken from Wikipedia, and then there are images also pulled from Wikidata. I did the same for creators. So here we have Jackie Weaver, um, short kind of uh, intro statement, a more, you know, some filmography notes, and then an image. And they've actually started using this on their site. So before this was pretty sparse, but now we can see this wonderful photo of um, Abel Ferreira. Looks really thrilled. And, um, and this kind of uh, intro text as well to provide some context. Uh, yeah. So I also wanted to take a second to just acknowledge that both Acme and Wikidata both make their data available under a CC0 license, which allows for essentially uninhibited use and reuse. And this, uh, this allowed me to really kind of work in the open. So it was open code, open data, and um, I think when Acme first released their collection data in 2016, and I managed to hunt down, no, it's this one. Um, I managed to hunt down that very first commit. I thought it was a super bold and inspiring move, and I would really urge other institutions to consider doing the same. I thought I'd give you a little run through of the tools we created uh, behind the scenes for Acme as well. So uh, this is our Wikidata dashboard. 
um, showing both uh, works and creators that are matched in Wikidata um, here, and also then uh, how many have been added to uh, Acme IDs to Wikidata itself. So um, these two figures should match, and these two figures should match too. Um, and you'll see that uh, polls actually matched a huge number in the last little while. So what we need to do is uh, pull those records into a spreadsheet for our collections team to do a little spot check of. And once they're happy, then we'll re-import them back into XOS uh, so that they're exposed on our website. There is kind of this initial kind of mountain that we're trying to get over. <laughs> And then I'll be really curious as to, um, yeah, how much effort it is to maintain sync from then on. Uh, after that, I think there's going to be a lot of work done around looking at incompatible data statements. So an example I had here was I've done a quick notebook on where birth date does not match. So these are creators where there's a creator in, um, creator has a birth date in Wikidata and in the Acme database and they don't match. Uh, and that could be just because one side got it wrong or it could be because um, we actually merged the wrong person, right? So this kind of thing can highlight where there were mistakes in the matching process. Um, yeah, but I think that's it. I think that's the end of the talk. And uh, I think there are a few minutes for questions if anyone wanted to uh, ask anything. Any questions? Any questions from the chat or from the live stream? Hey Paul, it's Samaya. Um, I think this is a very badly formed question. I hardly think it's a question at all. Um, so for organizations to get into doing this, you've probably spent some years thinking about pulling this data together. What would, if we wanted to try as an organization doing something small, what would you suggest doing first? There's a bit of a delay because Dave is uh, live transcribing. Um, well, firstly, can everyone hear me? Like, hello. And um, uh, to answer your question, Samaya, I, I think, um, do you remember me? I think Open or Fine is such a fantastic tool. Like, not to, like, uh, and I think, mate, I hopefully that came across that it was so invaluable in this project. Um, and I've, I've since been using it a lot for kind of, data wrangling, but the fact that it integrates so well with Wikidata, I would say that's absolutely a fantastic place to start. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Then, thank you, Paul. Let's give a... Hmm? And Simon, yes, who was not there on the uh, screen, but thank you. Let's give him a Thank you. I hope I got away. The next presentation is also a pre recorded video um, of that's. The next presentation um, is from Marco Suero Ball, um, Adventures in Probabilistic 
record linkage. Hello, my name is Marcos Suedo. I'm the archive manager at New York Public Radio. We are an um, organization that uh, has a couple of public radio stations in the city of New York in the United States. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, I wish I could be there in Prague with you, having um, a Stato Pramen or a Brochek, but uh, one of the wonderful beers there, but um, we're going to have to talk about this instead. Sorry about that. All right, let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about probabilistic record linkage, which is a mouthful, but it actually is not as bad as it sounds. So some of the recent projects that we've been working on um, at the station are uh, the ones listed here, and they usually involve um, kind of merging two data sets. And we'll go through these um, in more detail. The common issues among all of these projects that are, we've been involved with are that we have two separate data sources, and there are no clear connections between these uh, data sources. And that Many times we've had to rely on text in order to infer certain connections. The workflow, generally speaking, is to parse out patterns, for example, words, um, and then from a, a source data set, and then try to find probable uh, matches in um, the destination data set. So uh, again, parse out patterns, generate pattern statistics. This is not strictly necessary, but it usually helps. And then match a source to a destination. Uh, and that may include, uh, of course, a list of potential matches and a confidence index maybe. And finally, uh, so far we have a human review the results. And this generates what we call ambits or, or spheres of assets that are connected. So we feel that this is useful. It also usually involves very large data sets or what we think of large data sets that kind of preclude the possibility of a human going through all of them. All right. So here's one of the first ones we did. We had uh, press releases that the station issued back in the 1980s for certain shows. In this case, it's one called uh, Senior Edition. And um, we had the database uh, on one side and these press releases on the other side. And sometimes the database didn't have a great description, but the press releases did. So it was in interesting to try to find connections between these two so we could um, import the data into our database. So what we did was because we had the date as ISO, we formatted it via XPath to a format that matched the press releases uh, once we OCR them. So we had the press releases scanned, we uh, converted them into text, and then we had a script go through them systematically to try to find a match for um, our database. And this was successful, as you can see, not 100% of the time, but many times it worked. And um, this allowed us to then um, take that uh, description from the press releases and incorporate it into uh, our data set. Here's uh, another uh, project that we're still working on, in fact. And this one was a, a different show called On the Line. We asked the producers to give us their uh, list of uh, guests. So the show usually was divided into several sections, and each section would have at least one, uh, one guest. So. Um, 
In this case, as you can see, there was a segment called International Coalition of Historic Science Museums of Conscience, and it included a reference to this person, Ruth J. Abram. And, and then we have here, well, it also included what this person was, which is in this case, or back in 2000, was the president of a museum, a local museum. So then in this case, the match was to the Library of Congress authority files. We're interested in having authority files from the Library of Congress to um, facilitate discovery. And what the what the um, script did was try to match it using the Library of Congress API to possible contributors using uh, these texts, basically. So you're gonna say, okay, so far we haven't talked about probabilities at all. So why are we showing us this, Marcos? Well, okay, so there's a little detail here that I'm gonna highlight, which is that we had four, it found four possible matches, but one good match. One good match meant it's more probable. Why is it a better match? Because it includes the middle initial Ruth J. Abram. All the other matches do not include Ruth J. Abram. So the script says, okay, we found four pot potential matches or possible contributors were one that is particularly good because it has Ruth J. Abram. And of course, all these, um, these documents include links to um, the Library of Congress, as well as descriptions in our database of these segments. This is to help the operator choose the right person. Here's another example from the same project, same kind of thing. Um, Mr. Edward T. O'Donnell back in 2002 spoke about hooligans, whiskey, and shenanigans, which sounds great. And um, there were several, in fact, 14 possible matches, but there were two good ones that included Edward T. O'Donnell. So, you know, this is pretty primitive um, probability matching, but you could see that this is um, something we were working towards. Here's another project where we took uh, web descriptions from a show that was recently terminated called um, um, uh, the takeaway, and it had um, very well described descriptions on the web. So there was a lot of published stuff. And um, in this case, we took those descriptions and parsed out the, um, ho the guests that were in that section. In this case, um, the way we did it was because in the HTML that was um, in the web description, the the ho the guests, excuse me, were usually either highlighted as strong, you know, like the tag strong or 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 bold, or they were um, used. Um, they included a hyperlink, so we used that those kind of cues to parse out the last name, and then we looked for files. We were interested in finding the raw interviews of those uh, guests. So, and that was potentially described in a file. And those are the file names, kind of. They're actually David titles. Uh, David is our, our internal database. So the connection was between the web and raw interviews that we may have in this folder that included a quarter of a million files. So we couldn't really go through through all of them uh, manually, but once we limited them, it was kind of easy, ended up being about a thousand plus that we chose from this um, very, very large set. We did it by matching the string, but also by limiting the potential matches to files that were created, um, I think within 10 days of the published date. So if something was published uh, in 2014, December 19th, we only included files within 10 days previous to that publishing date, thinking that um, this is a radio station, we focus on news. So most of the time we have interviews that are you know timely. So we're interested in files that were that were um, related to that to that uh, or, or related to that published file 
in a recent uh, manner. Here's another example, and here's where we first find um, our uh, use of uh, um, statistics in a way. We have two people in this case named Cedric Alexander and Elizabeth Alexander. And you'll see in red, this is still from the same project, we include the following warning. Attention, the term Alexander appears 85 times in this set. Choose carefully. Why do we include this? Well, it, I think it's pretty explanatory, self-explanatory, but um, in, the, in the destination folder, um, the files included the term Alexander 85 times. It's not many, many times among 250,000, but we wanted we wanted the um, the uh, user to kind of be the person who chooses which the, the files, the related files, to be aware that this is a fairly common term and to kind of pay extra attention to this. So this is our first time we started using um, descriptions. Uh, sorry started using uh, statistics. Finally, uh, we have currently a project where we're trying to match newscast segments to raw footage. So on the upper left um, rectangle, you have, it's, it's all within the same system, but there's two separate folders. One includes uh, segments that have been broadcast. Um, in, in fact, it includes clips that are used in segments that are part of newscasts. So the, the hierarchy is newscasts, segments, and then clips. And clips are usually kind of raw, um, not raw, but kind of uh, little snippets of audio that are used to kind of um, make the, the newscast more likely. Um, so maybe there'll be a man on the street interview and they'll, they'll talk about a little bit of something. Um, we were interested in perhaps um, saving these uh, raw footage that was related to these snippets. So if we use like five seconds from uh, at, a, at a news segment, we were interested in finding the original recording that uh, the producers may have added, the journalists may have added to, um, to the system. So again, there was a folder of raw footage, there's a folder of newscast segments, and we're trying to connect them both. In this case, we didn't have a single uh, term or word, so we had to be a little more sophisticated. How do we do it? And again, this is still being developed, but this is what we're doing right now. Um, this is the kind of the chooser document we're gonna use, very similar to the one we used before for uh, matching files with um, web descriptions. In this case, um, what we do is parse out the original file title, um, which in this case was this uh, news, 20, blah, 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 gay marriage, Kruger 2. And we kind of parse out them in, and split it into words. And we, as you can see in blue, the um, it uses marriage and Kruger. Why not uh, the word gay? Because it has three, only three characters. So as a convention, we generally like uh, words that are four uh, characters or longer. And this is arbitrary, but this is what we have used. Um, and again, we, we, we're still tweaking it. So then you can see there's three potential matches, right? Three potential files. So one of them is, um, actually matched both words, marriage and Kruger, and um, the combined word frequency is 0 0.0162. So we multiply the frequency of each of those uh, terms and uh, kind of figure out how unlikely is it that this is by chance, um, if you will. And, um, you know, that's 0.0162%, so it's very, very small. It still could happen that that, and it does happen. In fact, that the things match by more than one word, and the combined word frequency is actually not that high, but it's actually unrelated. But it's unlikely. It's unlikely. It it's, it happens because the the set is so large. It's two hundred fifty thousand files that it does happen. But um, this is kind of a, a guide. It's kind of a more sophisticated way of uh, 
of warning people, if you will. So, um, and then the other two just uh, matched by the word marriage. We did a very similar thing. In fact, we limited the potential files to one week. And uh, this cuts down both um, both uh, processing power and and time for the for the uh, person to review this. Um, so there you have. It. Um, in terms of what we've learned in these processes, is I'm going to give some some general. Um, advice, I guess, that we that we have found useful, some tips that we have found useful. First is to really get to know your data sets, both sides, the source and the destination. Just kind of poke around and, and look at it and, and, and search and do database searches. Um, one thing that we found, for example, that didn't work is matching by authors. So because in the process that we have here, turns out, and this is number two, I'm, I'm going into number two already of the tips, but um, many times engineers will come in and edit something that uh, a person has entered um, in one file, uh, in one folder. And then, um, you know, start looking for possible connections and then also define what you want to find. Another thing that I, I didn't speak about this, but we wanted to only save files that are substantial. So we said anything less than five minutes, we're not gonna be interested in, uh, in terms of saving the file. And then kind of try to analyze yourself, how you do it manually, how you would match uh, a data set A with data set B, or like what fields would you use? How would you go for it? And then of course, start small, start with a subset and, um, and, and, and try it. And, and try the script once you have developed it and see what uh, false positives and false negatives you get. And finally, of course, be aware of the limitations. Um, and again, I think at this point, we're only, uh, we're using this only with, um, with a human review, but it, of course it helps, uh, it cuts down on the time by, by a lot. Limitations, speaking of limitations is of course, one of the classic ones still happens every time is precision versus recall, meaning how many false positives are you willing to take versus how many false negatives you're willing to take. And this is, you know, a classic um, in our in our world. That's that's what we live with every day. In our case, we were limited by date. We limited uh, by length. So uh, by date, you know, we said seven days before the published date say but you know why not eight or why not five so you know uh these are things that you choose at one point and uh by length we said like i mentioned five minutes but we may be missing terrific files that are four minutes and and 50 seconds by doing that but um again it's it's a balance you know a precision versus recall the other limitation, of course, is misspellings. Um, I did that on purpose, yes. And um, because it uses string matching, um, misspellings are not um, caught. So if, especially with last names, if someone found out that the last name was different and they, they fixed it in the process, then um, we don't have that. And then the, the matching is non-semantic. So again, it's, it's just a string matching. Um, for future developments, and it is all related, we may want to have a bigger uh, source orbit, if you will. So um, instead of just having instead of just having um, the the as as the words the words from the title itself, we may have a second tier, if you will, uh, that includes the entire text of that uh, uh, newscast in this case, where that clip was used and then try to match with that. So kind of like a bigger Venn diagram uh, 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 matching. 
Another possibility is to allow for small distance spellings, meaning that if there's one, only one uh, letter, one character difference between the matchups, that could be interpreted as, okay, it's okay. And there's, there's ways to do that. It's not that difficult. And then uh, more generally speaking, we may, uh, this is a goal that we have to have decreased operator roles. So maybe do things like, okay, we're pretty sure this is a match. So we're gonna check it for you unless you think, um, you know, still having an operator kind of be able to uncheck, but kind of have a limit Again, in that combination of of um, uh, of likelihood, um, have a interval, uh, a confidence interval where above that we feel like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna check it. But again, we're a little uncomfortable still not having um, an operator kind of review the results. That's it. Here's a list of uh, the staff at the uh, New York Public Radio Archives. Feel free to drop us a line and uh, we'll try to um, to uh, answer your question. And speaking of questions, I'm open to questions right now. Thank you very much. Any questions for Marcos? I'm almost sorry to ask, but have you thought about applying large language models into your uh, string matching to, to start adding some of that semantic context? Large language models into your uh, adding some of that semantic context. Okay, can you hear me? Um, I think the question was, have we thought about applying language models to our, our string matching? And um, the answer is that our our corpuses, if you will, are pretty unique. So many times um, they don't. You could barely call them English. <laughs> so language models would probably not be uh, very useful. We're not you know, opposed to doing it, but um, I think um, you know, on, on the one hand, the sets are large enough to not be uh, manageable by a person without some help. But on the other hand, um, it's easy to kind of create statistics about them and kind of create a corpus really. Uh, from them so um, but we might we might we might try to use language models that use our particular corpus um, we just haven't done that yet and kind of create a corpus really uh, from them good then thank you Marcus Give him an applause. The next one is a uh, presentation by Nick. Krabben, uh, Krabbenhoofd, AV formats in pronom. Um, just AV formats in pronom. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, can I go full screen and go like slide by slide here? Oop, nope. There we go. Ah, beautiful. Okay, great. So um, this is a conference about audiovisual material, and it's a conference where many of us 
know of and use and love the many tools supported by the media area team among the media info. Um, and media info is, of course, my preferred tool to start to understand what a media file might contain. Oh, let's get a logo up there. It's also the preferred tool of the repository system that I use at work. However, it's not the first tool that my repository system uses. Before my repository can examine a file with media info, it first needs to know that it is a media file. So what does it use? It uses Droid. Um, and uh, it could also potentially use something like Siegfried or Fido. Uh, whether you're an Archivmatica user, LibSafe user, Preservica user, Rosetta user, or user of a number of other digital repository systems, um, these, are the t these tools are the foundational block for a lot of their workflows. Um, uh, basically, um, any and all of these tools actually rely on the same database to characterize files based on a bunch of format profiles. Um, that database is called Pronom, um, and it is maintained by the National Archives of the U UK. So when I, as a user, see a file with an extension like MP4, my first thought is to try Media Info and see if it works, see what it tells me. When my repository sees that file, it applies Droid. It applies Droid no matter what kind of files that sees. And most likely, it's going to see that file and say, ha, this is FMT slash 199. Uh, that's actually a video format. So now I can go ahead and use media info to collect more information or run media conch or create der uh, derivatives with FFmpeg or any of a bunch of other uh, little workflows. The purpose of this talk is to illustrate the gap that actually comes into play here because we have that dependency. Um, and outline some of the work that's needed to address those gaps and then encourage members of this community potentially to help contribute to a solution. So this is the gap. Um, this first step, what happens when a file isn't matched against any pronoun profile or it matches the file to more than one pronoun profile? If, if that happens, I as a user can research the issue and come up with an alternate solution. But my repository system, it can't do anything. It deals in binaries. So the file is either a specific pronoun format or it's nothing at all to my repository. And here is an example of exactly that happen. Um, I've taken an extract here. This is a uh, news list posting from um, the Archivmatica user group. And uh, this Archivmatica user is processing a file named aod.mp4. And Archivmatica isn't sure what it is. Um, Media Info is very confident if, if uh, you apply that. It says, hey, it's an MPEG-4 container, and it can tell you that it has H.264 video and all kinds of stuff. But uh, Siegfried isn't so sure. It says that it's either FMT slash 199 or FMT slash 596. Uh, you can see that down here. So um, a naive solution to this problem would be to have a system that can also use media info to identify file formats. But that actually creates more issues. Uh, now the issue has to run, uh, now the system has to run two tools instead of one on every single file. And if there's other classes of files that have good characterization tools, I'm thinking like disk type for disk images and EXIF tool for image formats, things like that, we'd need to add those tools to the system. And then we'd also have to build a system to probabilistically determine which of those tools has the most correct way to identify a file format. So overall, it's getting more complicated. And typically, that would be a repository system by repository system approach. That, that is not the kind of uh, tide that lifts all boats. It just lifts the boats of the people using one specific system. So um, it would be better to look at why pronom is uncertain and to improve the pronom record. Um, that way, a solution um, would be less complex to implement. We could just hand it out in a pronoun update. And it also benefits the community at large instead of just a single user or a single repository system. So let's look at those two pronoun profiles. Uh, here is part of the profile for FMT slash 199. It's named the MP4 media file. Uh, you can see that here with name. Um, and it's supposed to describe the generic MPEG-4 part 14 multimedia container format that we are all familiar with. And now here is um, FMT uh, 596, yes. Um, it's named the Apple Lossless Audio Codec. It's supposed to describe a specific variant of the MPEG Part 14 multimedia container format that Apple uses to deliver lossless audio files from its music store. In this example that I described, the file contained video. So how is it being matched to this thing, which only talks about audio? 
Well, for that, I'm going to have to describe how format characterization works in the pronoun world. But pronoun faces a core issue of any attempt to identify file formats. Um, it has to answer the question, what is a file format? Well, at a superficial level, it's a standard way to encode information for storage on a computer. Great. But what's a standard way? Um, there are no standard features really shared between all file formats. Um, an AVI video file has more in common with a uh, WAVE audio file than an MP4 video file. The structure of the advanced authoring format used for video editing has more in common with old Microsoft Word files than it does with MXF um, multimedia containers that were also developed by the same body. So there's not a lot of similarity going on in the world of file formats. And people have used a lot of different strategies to encode information for storage on a computer, so we have to use a lot of different strategies to identify those different strategies. Um, they break down into two in the world of Pronom. Um, number one is an external signature, uh, which is also known as the file extension generally. Uh, that's the last few characters at the end of a file name. Like a JPEG file could have JPG, capital JPG, capital JPEG, JPE. As that example demonstrates, external signatures aren't 100% reliable. There are recommended file naming practice with plenty of room for interpretation and corruption. However, they're still pretty useful. The internal signature is a sequence of bytes within the file that all examples of that format have. Because it's part of the file itself, this is less susceptible to the shenanigans like file system limitations or user practices. There's no universal standard for how a file format should identify itself, so these internal signatures can describe features like magic numbers, the file systems embedded within a zip container, the frame-based structure of the MP3 format. There's a lot of different things they can do. Um, so any uh, format in Pronom will include one or more definitions for either or both of these signatures. But then you run into the next level of the problem. How do you separate one format from another? There's no standard for that. What one person might call a WAV file with extra metadata, another person might call a broadcast WAV version 2.0. What one person might call a QuickTime movie file, another will call an MPEG-4 file with a QuickTime profile. Uh, it's an ontological problem, and since there's no natural definition of file formats, uh, that leads us to the problem of, well, everybody just kind of defines file formats um, according to their own standard. And really, the best way that we can say something about a format is that Something is a file format if somebody has said, I think this is a file format. That's, that's about as, as strong as we can go. So add in, the time and field ex add in the time and the field expertise needed to maintain all of these different efforts, and you have the core of our MP4 problem. When AOD was examined, it did not match any of those internal signatures in the Pronom database. So it was then matched against the external signatures, of which two are documented to use MP4, both FMT199 and FMT596. And because a file extension is a pretty weak indicator of a format, it's hard to trust its identification. And so Siegfried says, it's probably one of these, but I'm not going to say you know, one more than the other. On the other hand, when the file was examined with MediaInfo, it did match a byte sequence that MediaInfo associates with the MPEG-4 multimedia container, and that byte sequence is actually different than the one that is defined within Pronom's FMT199. So let's take a look at those actual signatures. Um, you can see here at the bottom, it's this long string. It's a kind of pseudo-regular expression going on. Um, we have uh, the following character sequence identified. Any four bytes, then the bytes for F, T, Y, and P, then 0 to 64 bytes of anything whatsoever, and then either the bytes for MP42, MP41, ISOM, or ISO2. And then some more undefined bytes, and finally the bytes for MOOV. Now let's look at how MediaInfo does this. It's uh, a little bit simpler. Um, we have MediaInfo starting and saying any four bytes, we're just going to whatever, uh, we're going to go four bytes into the file. And then the bytes for FTYP, MDAT, SKIP, or FREE. -E. Um, and so if it matches any one of those four patterns, it says, great, I think this is an MPEG-4 uh, um, file and uh, continues on its way. And there's already a clear difference here. MediaInfo is very direct. It's very simple. It's looking for basically four bytes at a very specific position, whereas the pronoun signature is looking for one of those patterns, but in a more generic container. and 
um, also with additional aspects to it. So it's being more specific, um, but in, in because of that, it's actually perhaps being over-specific. So um, that difference in specificity is exactly where AOD um, falls through the cracks. Looking at the first a, uh, 80 bytes of that unidentified MP4 file, media info looks at the first eight, identifies as an MPEG-4, and then moves on to the rest of its process to pull out other information. Any pronoun-based tool will look, read those first eight, say, oh, potential match, but then try to match the rest of that pattern, and no, it's not going to find anything. Now, um, part of that problem um, is when you look at this, uh, that MP4.1, MP4.2, ISOM, ISO2, um, those are all part of the area of MPEG-4 part 12 that are used to declare the particular brand of a MPEG-4 file. Um, and those were declared in 1999, 2003, 2004, and 2005 revisions to the MPEG part 14 and MPEG 4 part 12 things. I'm sorry, I might get the 12 and the 14 confused. I've had a hard time with that. Now, um, the problem here is I said 2005 revision, and there have been more revisions since then, and each one of them have added additional sequential brand numbers, ISO 3 to ISO 9, and then ISO A to ISO C. So any valid MPEG-4 file can actually have a lot of different patterns in there, not just ISOM and ISO2, but everything from zero, or I guess two to C in, in a, a hex counting system. So at this point, I'm gonna introduce you to yet more MPEG-4 vocabulary. Um, MP4 is an MPEG-4 part 14, but MPEG-4 part 14 is a variant of MPEG-4 part 12 which is also known as the ISO base media file format, which I pronounce as ISO BAMF. I'm not sure if that's right, but it's easier. So an instance of an ISO BAMF file often includes at least one of the brands that I've listed so far, and uh, to declare its alignment with a specific revision of MPEG-4 part 12, and an additional brand if it's a more specific variant. So for example, a QuickTime profile MP4 includes the bytes for QT in that area of the file to say, I am a QuickTime profile, not just a regular MP4. So based on all of this, uh, we can see a couple of ways to actually address the original problem. First, we could create a pronoun profile for ISOBAMP that just looks for those um, first four patterns that we see on media info. Or we could update FMT199 uh, to look for more of those ISO brands. Or we could create a new pronoun signature for each revision of ISOBAMP um, or we could do some mixture of these. But since there's no objectively right way to define file formats, deciding on a specific solution is difficult. And um, in considering what we should do, let's look at the wider pronom environment. So first, another feature of pronom is that profiles can have relationships to each other that can help resolve conflicts when internal signatures matches uh, overlap. So for example, if a file has an internal match of both FMT596 and FMT199, the FMT596 match takes priority according to this list. The same for FMT199 and FMT357 and FMT1595, which are for 3GP and uh, CR3 formats. And CR3 is a great exa example of this because it shows just how widely ISOBAMF has been adapted. CR3 is the Canon RAW still image format. It replaces CR2, which of course replaced CRW, um, both of which were variants of TIFF. But CR3 jumps into the ISOBAMF uh, world and specifically into the MPEG-4 variant of ISOBAMF. So uh, you can even analyze a CR3 file with media info and uh, what happens is all of the I think it's multiple resolutions of the image that are contained within that file show up as video tracks because of the way that they're using the features of the MPEG uh, standard. Um, it includes an ISO, uh, an ISO number uh, brand as well as that CRX sub-brand to say I am a you know, Canon RAW file. Uh, let's see, what else? Here's another image format, HEIF, the image format that an iPhone camera now uses. That's an ISO BAMF variant. Um, although it doesn't show up in the FMT199 priority listing because it is directly off of ISOBAMF. It's not off of part 14, just part 12. Uh, you can also analyze these files with media info, and that will show you how the image is broken down into 512 by 512 image blocks, um, uh, and you'll get something like 
20 plus different little uh, image tracks that Media Info will tell you exist within this file. Uh, it's a pretty interesting thing. It does not include that MP4 one or an ISO number or anything in that. It just says HEIC. Uh, another image format that uses MPEG-4, just to, I, I, I'm fascinated that all these image people decided that the Motion Picture Experts group did, you know, made the best file format. But um, a number of formats uh, by JPEG, the Joint Photographic Experts group, like JPEG XL, JPX, JPXR, or JPEG XR, they all use ISOBAMF. Um, these aren't in Pronom at this point. However, it's not clear how successful these formats are. So, you know, it might not be useful to create Pronom entries for them. Um, they use brands like JXL, JPX, and JPXB. And then finally, MPEG Dash. Um, so MPEG Dash is a way to deliver video over the internet using ISO BAMF containers. Um, this is another variant that's not in Pronom, but I've seen it in real life enough that I would like to have a Pronom entry, and somebody is working on one of those. Um, it's one of those file formats that's best understood as a whole bunch of files that have to be together in order to understand the whole thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you've, it's, it's a complicated one. Um, but given all these different formats, um, it would be nice to potentially put them in there. It would be nice to update FMT199. Uh, we have to think through this. And so at least an initial set of steps that I'm proposing is number one, we make that base ISO BAMF pro, uh, profile. Um, we're just looking for those four bytes. Um, and we add it in the priority heading for FMT199 and 1101 so that MPEG-4s and HEIFs are caught. Uh, now, this would have caught AOD.MP4, but would have called it just this generic weird file format that nothing really is by itself. So next, we go to the FMT199 profile, and we add all of these weird brands, 3 through C, to make sure that all of those can be caught up. A uh, question that I would have here is that because MPEG keeps releasing more variants of this, and I'm not fully certain how MPEG works, would it be better to just lie and say ISOZ exists and just allow all of those things, or would we be best off going back and updating this annually? And then finally, uh, going ahead and making more uh, format profiles for all of these additional brands. So things like uh, the CRX file format, which already has one, but maybe JXL or maybe MPEG Dash, et cetera. All right, so that's just talking about the pronoun problem. I spent 15 minutes on that, I think, uh, something like that. So uh, let me get away from ISOBAMF and talk about some of the other things that both Media Info and Pronom do. So Media Info identifies roughly 40 other container formats. Uh, this is rough, and I'm doing some weird counting in the back and the, out of the source code of Media Info, so it might be wrong here. But um, over half of these do not have pronoun profiles. Um, that includes uh, a lot of formats that are variants of established formats, like a lot of AVI variants, AMV, DivX, GVI, MTV. It also includes some platform-specific spe formats, like PlayStation Portable and Nintendo DS video formats, uh, which I'd love to see examples of. Um, and there's also file-based formats, like XAVC and BDMV. Um, so th those are all you know, interesting things, and I think um, at least for some of them, I'd love to have them in Pronom because I do see those files and Pronom currently doesn't say anything about them. On the other hand, um, Pronom has records for roughly 160 audiovisual formats. Now, the reason for that high count is that it's very uh, easy for me to see what Media Info calls a container and what are variants. It's harder for me to make that distinction in Pronom. So for example, there are 24 kinds of WAV file 24? No, I think I li limited, I think it's 20. Um, but there's a lot of different WAV files according to Pronom. Um, and those range from base wave to broadcast wave version 2 with extensible encoding to RF64 files. Um, each of them gets their own distinct profile. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that Pronom is both a community resource and a resource primarily used by the National Archives of the UK and maintained by them. So therefore, it's a little bit of what the National Archives thinks is a format becomes a format that gets tracked because they spend time doing this. Like, they, they, they have their fingers on the button here. Um, so similarly, um, there are some cases here like uh, what pronoun, what I would look at in Media Info as a combination of container and codec, uh, pronoun combines into a single thing. Um, that FMT F96 is a great example of that, the Apple lossless audio codec. 
well, that's a codec. That's not a format to me. So um, I would just consider that an MP4 with a codec. Um, but there are a couple of examples here, like um, uh, QuickTime containers with ProRes video streams or AUG containers with different audio uh, codecs inside of them. Um, each of them are given specific format profiles rather than just being lumped into the larger parent profile. But my final point is that Pronom is a foundational tool in the cultural heritage sector, and much like a lot of foundational tools, its current state is thanks to contributions of staff at the National Archives and a few volunteers. Among them, uh, Francesca McKenzie, David Clip Clipsum, uh, Ross Spencer, and Tyler Torstead, um, all of whom I've learned quite a bit from, and I'm missing a lot of names in that community as well. Um, however, I would say it would be better to have more participation from AV experts. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is that we love describing word processing files. There's not as many people going deep into you know, isobanf, as I just demonstrated. So, um, yeah, it's, it would be great to have more participation and get, there is a community there. Um, they have an active GitHub uh, um, uh, repo that shares a lot of resources, both about ongoing uh, um, profile development, but also uh, calls that you can join to talk to other people working on this and um, how you can actually get started yourself learning how to create a file format signature in compliance with Pronom and being able to update that. So, um, I think one of, one of the last thing I'll point out there is that, yeah, FMT199, one of the problems, just to say that we need AV people, is uh, that signature was written in 2009. So that is the biggest problem. It was written in 2009. Nobody's come back to it and said, oh, MPEG keeps issuing new versions of this. Maybe we should update it over time. So it would be great to have some people that are a little bit more aware of those changes and, and to be able to add them back. But uh, that is it for my presentation. Oh, well, I don't have that slide here, but thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. So how does this software detect uh, program streams or transport streams? Um, you mean how does like uh, like Siegfried or Droid, how do they detect those? Um, because you cannot detect them just by using signatures. Yeah, and it would be bad at that at that point. There, there's lots of things that I can't detect. Um, some of the problems that we've run into are text files. Like there are many things that you would call a text file format, a Python file, a C file, etc. It can't do it. It well, just I'm, it's bad at it. And the second. Like the worst thing is, uh, have you already seen those files that exist in the wild that are actually of two different, I mean, that, that actually fit two different signatures? Yes. Because these files do exist. Uh, so. And those types of files, yeah. So it's things that are like, uh, what, what's the fun one? That's like a GIF and an MP3, and it can be rendered as both depending on which program you can um, uh, put it in. Yeah, and it would show up as both, and, you know, that's one of those edge cases that if you run into it, you would love to have your repository system be able to flag it for you so you can say, this is my opinion. But um, what we really want to do is say, for the vast majority, they're probably just one format or the other. Um, that, that, that's the general solution to that. But Pronom isn't the solution to everything. However, since it is such a default solution in our workflows, it, it should be better than it is right now. Um, it needs continued investment from people there. I've missed the first part, I'm sorry, but um, I was wondering, um, do you know the Unix file command to identify files? Yes. Because uh. it goes beyond audiovisual, and when you mention the text files, it can basically, it has patterns for... Yeah, the, the, the problem with file is that it has a very... Uh, um, it outputs data in lots of different, it's not a very standardized output format, and so it's, it's hard to incorporate into this. But that is another place where there's a really good file characterization tool that would be fantastic to add as um, profiles into Pronom, like just harvest that data where possible. However, it does have the problem where it can actually run code, whereas Pronom is doing regex matching, and it's doing very like flat, what are the bytes, great, I see it. It can't do more, uh, how would you call it? It can't respond to the bytes that it sees and start making tests along those lines, yeah. One more question. 
Uh, thanks for your presentation. That sounds like a really sensible approach that you outlined there for updating those PUIDs, just um, based on my own research um, on file formats. Um, we're in a similar boat at Cambridge University Libraries, but in regards to research data formats. So we have um, something like over a million files that can't be identified with Pronom. Not to say that there's anything wrong with those files, but that the entries don't exist in the registry at the moment. Um, but just to echo what you're saying as well, I think any sort of push to update Pronom will need to come from the AV community or whatever community um, is around the particular content that's being created just because the limit of resource on TNA. Um, so if there is kind of an idea to have like a working group focused on AV preservation, I think that would be a good um, way forward to um, improve so Pronom for AV. Yeah, I, I would say um, if you're interested in helping with it, it's join a call, um, and there are people there working on you know their own specific domains, but they can also just be a good sounding board for you know this is a good idea, bad idea. Uh, we've made some other changes of you know creating parent formats for things like RIF, um, so that any random RIF container at least gets that RIF identification, even if that specific variant hasn't been found yet. What would also be really helpful is um, the creation of sample data to improve um, Pronom and, and eventually Droid in the signature release, because I think that's something that can hinder updates being made as well, that the examples um, perhaps don't exist or can't be found and, and will need to be created. So if there was a repository of um, sample formats that could be used for testing, I think that would be really helpful as well. Yeah, and you know, what, one of the ways that I got started doing this is talking to people and saying like we have a file format and there you know when I talk about people with deep expertise we once shared a file with David Clipson who was like oh yeah that's Zyrite and I had no idea there is no format profile for it but he had enough of experience working with that family of formats uh, that he was able to say okay here's where we can at least start our research and start thinking about where it is so um, even if you aren't at the level where you feel I can write a format profile which almost nobody is at the beginning um, you can share a format, you can share an example file, and you can start the conversation there and get some help. Thank you. One more round of applause. Um, we have a break till 40 past.